You are listening to Uncomfortable. Comfortable conversations around uncomfortable topics. Hello and welcome to Uncomfortable, the podcast. I'm your host, Debbie Roach, and today I chat with Sarah and Chloe, creators and hosts of the independent podcasts Warriors Bards and Brews and Feminist Killjoys. We do talk about the really awesome podcasts, which I highly recommend you listen to, and you'll find out more about them soon. But today's episode focuses on gender identity and gender affirming surgery, and how Sarah's decision to go through gender affirming surgery has impacted their relationship. As always, there is some very strong language in this episode, so when you're listening, make sure to pop on those headphones. Sarah and Chloe, thanks so much for coming on the Uncomfortable Podcast. It's great to have you both. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh, you're welcome. I am a fan of one of your podcasts. The other one, the, the Warriors, Bards and Brews, because I don't know Xena so much. <laughs> I have listened to a couple of episodes. Um, I should watch Xena just so I can get the references. But uh, your Feminist Killjoy podcast is uh, a really fun a pop culture one that uh, you know I want to listen to when I'm just kind of easing around the house. So uh, oh, thank tell you. Us, yeah. yeah, you're welcome. And I'll definitely share links to your podcast so that everyone listening can check them out as well. But before we kind of dive into the the topic, um, just tell us a little bit about yourselves. And I'm curious to know how you met as well, actually. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. That's <laughs> like the biggest gay nerds. Um, uh, well, I'm Sarah. Uh, I'm originally from Nova Scotia. Um, I've been in Vancouver for 10 years with you, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 10 years. Um, and we met online. We met on the Kate Bush sub forum of a large Tori Amos message board. So, yeah. I mean, it makes sense that we have a music podcast yeah. <laughs> called Feminist Killjoys. And that we talk about Tori Amos and Kate Bush within the first five episodes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. It's like so beautifully dorky. It's just... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Whenever we tell, whenever we tell anybody, even if they're not like really well versed in like the music community or the queer community, they're like, "That is the most on brand nonsense for you two." <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's awesome. So, was that the inspiration behind the two podcasts that you've got? Like, tell us a little bit about why you started them. I think with, I think with the Xena one. Um, that was just us. Like we would go to all the East Van breweries on a Saturday, get a bunch of beer, and go home, drink the beer, and watch Xena. Uh, and then one night you were making a bunch of funny jokes. Chloe was making a bunch of funny jokes about it. So I just kind of hit record on my phone and like recorded what we were saying. And then the next day I listened back when we were sober and it was still very funny. Yes. And that is literally how the podcast was born. We were basically like, we like to get tipsy and yell about Xena at one another. We may as well make it into a podcast. I'm sure there's an audience for this. Let's go. <laughs> Holy as an audience for it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's a fairly small audience, but it's a dedicated audience. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we have fun and I think some people enjoy it. So Yeah, we have people who, who talk to us on Twitter and stuff, which is wild. I'm like, there's people out there listening to our nonsense and our cat screeching in the background <laughs> while we just yell about Xena being queer. I love that your cat is part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's always part he's of always it. He's always part of it, um, yeah. And I think with our other podcast, Feminist Killjoys, I mean, again... You know, one of the things we do is just have really lengthy conversations with one another about music. And we are together because the music that we love brought us together. So it just seemed natural for us to, yeah. I don't know, formalize it, I guess. Just have well, we fun were... <laughs> while doing something, you know. How that one came about was we were in Victoria over Christmas and we were in a pub waiting to get the bus back. 
some shit, some shitty pop song. There's like um, Lola or something, or like Jesse's Girl, or some crappy song from the 70s or 80s came on in the pub, and we were like, "Oh god, this song is tragic." If you look at, if you listen to the lyrics, this is awful. Oh my god, this is this wouldn't fly now. And then Chloe's like, "Yeah, we should start a podcast and call it Feminist Killjoys. We're here to ruin your music." And I was like, "I'm put that's new Twitter <laughs> handle. I'm on it right now. Let's go. New email. Let's set it up." And she's like, "No, no, no, no. We already have one." I'm like, "But this is going to be fun." <laughs> oh, I know. It's awesome. I love the one uh, you did, the police. Uh, and what's the song oh, yeah. again? Um, don't stand so close to me. Don't stand so close to me. I didn't know what that was I didn't about. Either. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, I grew up listening to the police. My parents, like my dad, is a huge fan of the police and like a lot of like avant garde eighty stuff. So I was, you know, listening to the, like I knew all the words to Roxanne when I was like four years old, which again, you know, not probably the best appropriate song for a four year old to be singing along to in the grocery store. Um, but yeah, looking back, I'm like, that, that was not good. That was not a good thing for children to be exposed to. <laughs> I know. What you learned, honestly, it's great. So listeners, do check out Feminist Killjoys. <laughs> it will ruin your favorite song for sure, but you'll actually be grateful <laughs> for it. <laughs> so yeah. again, I'll, I'll post all links so that people, yeah, people can subscribe. <laughs> so we're actually talking about a slightly more serious topic. Yeah, um, a little bit. <laughs> we're talking about gender identity and specifically gender affirming surgery so Sarah you had mentioned that you are you've started the process to go through gender affirming surgery so um if you don't mind sharing and thanks for being open to to sharing all this with us uh today I'm curious to know kind of what age you were when you started to kind of know that the gender you were assigned to at birth wasn't the gender that you know you felt that you that you were like what what age were you and how did that feel um I think looking back like I always felt very uncomfortable identifying as a woman but I also definitely did not want to do any sort of like hormonal transitioning I just wanted to be like blah blah without a gender (laughs) but uh I didn't realize that like non-binary identity or agender identity was actually an option until I was in my early thirties. And once I kind of learned about that and that was a thing, I was like, Oh, everything makes sense now. And I realized like a lot of the uncomfortableness was surrounding the gender terms and the gender identity people were perceiving me as. Um, And yeah, I realized that like a lot of the uncomfortable stuff was based on like chest dysphoria and like the obvious thing of me being coded as a female was, you know, titties. (laughs) And like, I had the joke, like, I need to get something off my chest, my boobs. I'm taking my heavy <laughs> surgery. <laughs> um, I know this is a very serious topic, but I'm I'm not a serious person, so I'm going to make a lot of jokes about boobs. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just had the conversation with my partner last night about, well, he thinks it's really funny that I find the word titties super uncomfortable. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't like it. I want boobies, but the word titties is, and it's like the same thing. So anyway, random side note. But, uh, yeah, just... um, <laughs> that's very interesting. I never thought about that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. So like, once I realized there was like a level of dysphoria, then it was like, okay, I'll, I'll handle that as best I can. And I, I've been wearing a, like a chest binder for years. Um, but recently it's come to the point where that's not quite doing enough to, to manage the dysphoria. So but about a couple, couple months ago, I guess, I decided like, yeah, I'm going to start looking into this and see what the process is and just kind of make the announcement. Not to mention that, you know, wearing the binder yeah. all the time is really uncomfortable, yeah. especially when it's, it's really like hot out. It's like polyester nonsense with like a compression front. And it's just like, it's not nice in the summer. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's, and it's not safe. I passed out a couple of times because yeah, <laughs> I got so, heat stroke. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I didn't even know that was that was something that you you could do, that that was an option out there. I mean, it's great that that's the option, you know, it's there, but at the same mm-hmm. time, yeah, it's obviously not doing wonders for your health no. and well-being. Um, so when you kind of discovered, you know, language like non-binary in your early 30s, and I definitely feel like that's been, for me, like a, a recent thing. I don't know, like when I was a teenager, I don't remember that language ever being used although I was raised Catholic so dear God oh, so was I. Um, I mean they tried they tried it didn't stick <laughs> yeah I know. yeah they tried exactly <laughs> um, so it's like you know once you realized that and you decided okay you know I want to use non-binary I want to use the pronouns uh, they them there's like what was that transition like like talking to family and friends about that 
I think it was okay. Like Chloe was pretty on it. She was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And she's like, you know, we've been together for 10 years, 11 years. So I don't think you were completely shocked about it. Um, I've always been a little bit on the more masculine side of things anyway. I'd say that I, no, I was surprised. Okay. And, uh, no, I was. And, yeah. <laughs> Never mind, ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to some extent, right? Like once Sarah told me, I was like, oh, that makes sense. But I was also just surprised because, you know, I, I, I married to this person and I thought they were a woman. And all of a sudden it's like, no, not really, actually. So, um, you know, I think anybody in that circumstance is going to, have a little bit of a period where they're like oh okay what does that mean and all that kind of thing and I probably did not react entirely the best I think I tried to be supportive but I had a lot of questions (laughs) yeah I mean (laughs) yeah because we had a lot of conversations around your identity too and like you know, you identify as a lesbian, like a woman who's attracted to a woman. And then you're like, well, what does this make me? And I was like, well, you still can claim that. Like you still are. It's just, I'm not in that category right now. Yeah. And uh, it's still something that I think about. And, but ultimately like I just, you know, I use queer too, but I do feel connected to the, to calling myself a lesbian. And I I guess some people might disagree with me that I am one because I am married to a non-binary person, but also like, I do not ever, you know, I, I never really have, once I figured out my sexuality, have wanted to be with a man at all. So, like, never, that's not a thing that would ever happen. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember when I saw uh, you do your, your talk at the Vancouver Podcast Festival and you were doing the Warrior Bards and Brews um and you had mentioned how when you were a kid, Chloe, you would watch, um, I can't remember if it was like Shira or some, oh no, so it was Xena, but before that He-Man or something or some Hercules or some other like male, you know, some guy oh, with yeah. abs. So yeah. it, was, it was Xena and Hercules were always sort of on back to back in the yeah. afternoon. And I, I was very, very into Xena, but could give no shits about Hercules. Like, <laughs> I was just like, do not care, muscly guy with his little vest. Get away from me. This is not interesting to yeah. me, even though it's basically the same show as Xena. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so it, it's just always been very, you know, it hasn't always been very clear to me. I guess there's that whole compulsory heterosexuality thing. But, you know, once I sort of figured myself out, I was like, okay, yes, this is it. <laughs> And looking back, I've always been very You've always gay. Been very gay. <laughs> yeah. Even when we first when we first met, she had a boyfriend, and I was like, "Oh, how's that going?" And she was like, oh, "I haven't kissed him yet." And I'm like, "How long you've been together?" She's like, "Oh, like a week." And I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> <laughs> and then, like two days later, you guys broke up. <laughs> <laughs> we were together for all of three weeks, and yeah. I managed to avoid kissing him the whole time, even though he would try really hard to kiss me. So poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! And so then, like alarm bells were ringing, and it was like yeah. that's something not quite right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least we met one another by that point, which is great. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, like Sarah, now you're at this point. You know, you decided a couple of months ago that you're going to start looking into this uh, surgery. So, was there like a particular thing or moment? that just kind of got to you and you're like, that's it. I'm doing it. Was it a series of moments? Like what was that kind of, you know, decision like to make for you? Um, oh man, I think it was kind of just like over, over the last year, I'd say it was just like the, the, the ability to handle the dysphoria (laughs) just in the way I had been is, is like I said, it was diminishing. And I think I started talking to you about this, like in December, I guess like December, like, or like a while ago. And you mentioned like, well, maybe like look into getting uh, like a reduction. And I was like, yeah, I, I, maybe I don't know. We'll see. Because another one of our friends had had a reduction yeah. and I was like, okay, well, you know, if you, it's a little bit of a less extreme uh, route to go. And that's what I thought that they wanted because that's previously what they thought too, that they didn't quite want to go the whole top surgery route. So that was me trying to <laughs> make my best suggestion, <laughs> which ultimately is not going to happen, but you know, that's yeah. how it goes. So, um, yeah. And I, I started looking into it and, um, I was just like, I don't know if that's going to be exactly 
what I want because with the reduction, there's always the the possibility that they can come back. Oh, okay. And like I, yeah, that is that is a bit of a risk. Like if um, there's like a liposuction component to the surgery, um, and with the reduction, like it's it's not guaranteed that they're going to stay that small. And I was just like, I don't want to take that risk, and I like, have to keep going back for like touch ups. <laughs> in a sense. Yeah. I mean, surgery in itself is terrifying, right? To go once, yeah. it's not something you want to have to yeah. keep going back for. Yeah. yeah, and I hate doctors. I hate doctors. I don't trust them. I This is like my own personal hell. But the fact that I'm go- going to go through my own personal hell means like this is quite important. I think that was your kind of like aha moment. When I say you, I'm like pointing at Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is, I think that was kind of her aha moment that I was like, this is something that had to be done because she knows like how much I do not go. To- I don't go to the doctor unless like my limbs are dangling off. and I'm like, I can't like duct tape myself back together. Yeah, no, literally, like, yeah. Sarah never goes to the doctor. Like, when they broke their ankle, it was very difficult to get them to try to even consider listening to the doctor about what they recommended. Like, it's just, um, <laughs> it's very frustrating, actually. Wow. So, so, yes, it definitely, when Sarah said, you know, I actually want to put myself under quite, like, intense surgery, then that was, really helped me understand that this is a big thing that is yeah. actually necessary for Sarah. Yeah, the fact that you're willing to go through your own personal hell as you just described. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, okay, okay, this is this is what to do. And what about how have you told and if so, how was the reaction of kind of like other family members and friends? Um, they were cool with it. I mean, like my, my dad is not so great with the pronouns. Um, like I don't think he's got them right ever, <laughs> no. uh, but my mom and my brother are fabulous. My brother, like when I told him I was non-binary, he called me when he was kind of drunk one night from Montreal and he's just like, you've always been like a brother and a sister. This is, I just, so awesome. I love you. And I was like, okay, that's cool, buddy. <laughs> Like not quite that. Not quite what I'm going for. Yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, you're you, you're almost there. You almost yeah. have it. That's good. Yeah, um, he tries. He tries. He tries. You now he's now he's not so train wreck. He, he understands it a little better. Um, but yeah, and mom again, like it took her a while, but she's she's on it now. Um, so when I told them, they were just like, oh, okay, it's, if that's what you want to do and that's what's going to make you feel comfortable, that's cool. Um, keep us posted on how things are going. And my brother's girlfriend, you know, she'll check in on on Instagram Messenger, like, how are things going? Like, what's new? With like, what's the details? Is the pandemic hurting anything? You know, I was like, yeah, it's slowing things down, but <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's unfortunate. You can't. Nothing's like everything's on hold right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, my family's been pretty cool about it. Um, like the few people I've told, like my friends I've told, they're all just super supportive. I don't think anybody was genuinely surprised. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Which That's is awesome. good, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's awesome. It sounds like you have like a very supportive circle of family and friends, which I know isn't often the case. Um, so yeah. that must be, you know, huge for your own mental health as well, right? Uh, yeah. Just to have people to talk to so like you've both alluded to this a little bit um but what do you think I mean you've probably talked about what the effect of this will be on your relationship and you've alluded to that a little bit but have you kind of sat down and really talked about after the fact will things be different for you won't they like is there anything that kind of came up like you had to have a uncomfortable conversation with one another of like possible things that could come up once the surgery is done um I guess maybe I should talk to that a little bit um so definitely when Sarah told me that they were going through with the surgery and this was again fairly recently I was a little upset uh not like angry or anything but I was upset because previously I had thought that was totally off the table so it was a little shocking and I just had to process things and also just like straight up I am a person who is attracted to breasts so I was just a little sad that they were going to be gone (laughs) you know and just it's a lot to and because it is such a big thing for Sarah because they are putting themselves through such a tough time and then there's going to be the recovery period which I think is going to be a little bit difficult for both of us because I'm disabled and I'm going to need to be able to do it, you know, pretty much everything for several weeks. 
This so, is why having the dishwasher and in-suite laundry is going to be very good for us at our yeah, new apartment. <laughs> yes. And uh, perhaps, you know, grocery delivery and maybe getting friends to cook us food a couple times might be helpful or something. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, I so yeah, I had the maybe week and a half period where I was kind of upset and we got into some... I don't even know if I would call them arguments, but just like really intense conversations where we were both really like sort of both a little keyed up about it, really keyed up about it. Um, And I don't know. Right now, as we're sitting here like two months later, I feel pretty good about it. I, I, I mostly just really want Sarah to be happy and comfortable with themselves. So yeah, I think it was just a really a, like a brief adjustment period, a processing period that I needed to have. And, you know, it's, I thought of, and I thought about it, I was like, well, if somebody, had, you know, had breast cancer and needed to have a mastectomy or whatever, it's not like I'm going to go and <laughs> be like, I, you know, I, I reject you now, obviously. <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, I think. It, I think, I think you just need a time to kind of like come around to it on your own terms and, and, have like the realization moments that you needed to have yeah and again i will miss breasts but i am <laughs> like straight up this is not the uncomfortable podcast but i, I don't not... think they'll put them in a jar for you or anything afterwards either like <laughs> an appendix or anything no, you might have just... to have a little like breast leaving party or something <laughs> you know? but i'm not just attracted to sarah because of their breasts so i i mean i don't think it's going to like vastly influence or affect our relationship we have a very very strong relationship yeah. we've been through a lot together we've yeah had some tough times but we have a very strong relationship so yeah we, we planned our wedding while our apartment was infested with bed bugs from our downstairs neighbor uh and we survived that so hey <laughs> you know, we both have you know mental health issues that have been very difficult to navigate and we've always you know we've had some road bumps but we've always eventually yeah. worked through them together and so i i feel confident yeah. that we'll be fine but yes, if you had the bed bug, you know how bad that is. Yeah. <laughs> I am still traumatized and it was probably about four years ago. And I, oh, yeah. yeah, it's awful. It's awful. I feel like anyone who goes through bed bugs can literally go through anything. Like, I really so feel bad. that's exactly it. I was like, we planned a wedding. We had a heat treat, all of our stuff in the middle of summer in the West End. Like, it was just nonsense. And I was just like, look, if we can get through this, get married and stay married, like, I think we're pretty fucking solid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is like a massive testament to your relationship. <laughs> <laughs> another reason I'm excited for laundry. Yeah, it's another reason. It's like, free building in sweet laundry, no risk of like bringing home a friend from the laundry room. <laughs> I know, I know. I won't even take out a library book or anything anymore no, because no, it, was, no, no, no. it was so no bad. Way. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I should, I should do an episode on bed bugs. I'm just worried that will bring the trauma back. <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I can talk about that. I could do that. I don't think you have that in you right now. Did you? No. <laughs> like we're still picking up stuff on the floor like is this the bug what is this is this a bug i'm truly highly traumatized like that is probably my biggest anxiety trigger like i I am a mess whenever there's any sort of perceived risk (laughs) yeah yeah i am with you and if i do that episode and if you're ready chloe will talk (laughs) i don't think i'll ever be ready to do that episode but sarah can do it and i can do it the apartment while we do it (laughs) she can go for a walk i'll hang it (laughs) And then I'll never listen. To <laughs> yeah. Okay, before I like heave, let's stop talking about bed bugs. <laughs> so, Sarah, can you share like so far what you've learned about the process? Obviously, with the COVID nineteen thing, everything is on delay, which really sucks. But I'm just curious to know like the legalities, how long it generally takes, um, if there's any like support that's offered to you, and do they do it in BC? Actually, is that something you can get done locally? Yeah. Yeah. So for my particular case, I went through TransCare BC. Uh, they're, they're a clinic. It's Three Bridges Healthcare. So they partner with TransCare BC and they, they're located downtown Vancouver. Um, so you basically just fill out a form online saying this is the surgery you're looking for for this reason. Um, and then you get it was supposed to be um, an intake assessment to see if you are a viable candidate for it. Then the wait list and whatever. But everything was put on hold. So I only had my assessment on Friday. And with that, it was an hour long 
ish conversation about like, what are you looking for? You know, how long have you been dealing with this? What have you been doing to mitigate your dysphoria so far? You know, but it's, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then it was, here's the risks, you know, they have to kind of go through all the, the risks, cover their own ass. Like here's everything that could go wrong. Do you still want to do it? Yes. And one of the things the nurse said was, you know, there's a, you know, with any surgery, there is a risk of um, a feeling of loss afterwards, but I don't think that's going to be the case with a lot of people who go through this surgery. And I was like, no, no, no. I could donate them to somebody I would right now. Um, <laughs> I, w- I would love to see like, um, like a trans donation thing. Like, can I donate these to a trans woman in need? <laughs> yeah, I know. Maybe you should suggest like, how would that work? Can it be done? I have <laughs> no idea. I'm like, could this be, this t- I don't need them. Like if s- someone else might need them. <laughs> yeah, it's a good pair of breasts. They could go to someone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they could use a good home. Like they still got some good life in them. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got, I know someone I can just be like, Hey, you want to go up a size? There you go. Um, but yeah, so it's, so I had the intake appointment and then, um, Actually, one thing that was really cool with the intake appointment was she asked if I had a family doctor. And of course, in BC, nobody fucking has a family doctor, especially in Vancouver. And she said, well, do you want like a doctor or like a nurse practitioner? You can kind of have like on retainer, I guess, just to if you need support during this or after this. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. So there's a a clinic downtown. um, They work with the trans center. uh, So I have a nurse practitioner under this now. So if I need anything post-surgery prior to it um if i end up just needing to go to the doctor for like i don't know a flu or a cold or something just give me some drugs i have that now so that's cool i don't plan to do this because i don't like doctors as i mentioned <laughs> <laughs> but it's good the option is there yeah did you, did you specifically pick nurse practitioner just so it wasn't a doctor even though there's not that much of a difference anyway no, <laughs> uh, no I, I picked the nurse practitioner because uh she works with the trans clinic and she's um she, basically she takes all their referrals so she's aware of like trans health needs and um it, it's you know it's a little more i don't know i guess she becomes more recommended via the clinic than just going through the the family practice website to get like a doctor from a lottery um so, and again, like as someone who is very well versed in, in trans health stuff. So if I go in with like anything posters, like, what is, is this okay? Like, is this thing normal that I can have someone who's very much aware of like, yes, you clearly had top surgery. Yes, that's fine. You can go home and just lay down again. So that was it. So, um, and after the intake appointment, I had a call within a few months, three months, four months to pick out my surgeon who I've already kind of got, I already have two in mind. So that might hopefully make it a little quicker, but we'll see. And after that, it's like a year to 18 months until I actually get to have the surgery. So it's a long fucking process. <laughs> Definitely. I know. And I mean, this whole situation is just COVID-19 has probably just made it a lot longer. Yeah. yeah. My initial appointment was March 17th, the, the day they literally shut down the city. And I was like, okay. All right. Great. You know, like, yeah. thanks. Like thanks guys, that's great. But they, you know, they were, they called me and they said, "Look, we're we're shutting down, but um, you are still on the list. You won't lose your space. Um, so we're just kind of bumping everything back a bit. And I think within two months, like that's that's not bad. Like it could have it could have been six, it could have been eight, but like I think a two month gap mm-hmm. between when I should have gone in and when I actually had the intake is is pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. And what about like support afterwards? I mean, do you do you think you'll need it? Sounds like you know you're so ready to get rid of your boobs that you <laughs> need any like emotional support after the fact. But is that something that they offer? Uh, I think that, I think there's there's support groups out there. There's uh, a lot of trans groups. You know, um, like social meetups in the West End. A lot of them in the West End because that's like the gay village. Um, and a, there's a lot of them for youth. So I'm a little too old to be <laughs> to be doing those. Um, but I think I think just like I make the joke that gays kind of flock together like penguins for warmth. So like we have a fairly big queer social circle. So I know if I need any sort of like queer buddy system, I have it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, my one of my friends, her roommate is moving into our building with our new place and she's been like living across the hall. So I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna have like a little queer nest already. This is great. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that you've got like yeah. that queer bubble, right? That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and we have and we have uh, what we call the lesbian army. Uh, we have our, when I broke my ankle, I was like, "Call the lesbian army! Someone's going to come get me off this mountain for good." <laughs> and when Chloe had her hand surgery last year, I was like, "I'm going to get the lesbian army in on this. We're going to get you home from the hospital." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, 
you must have so many like lesbian supporters from your podcast too that probably don't even reside in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, we have we have a lot of queer queer followers from the states. Um, and there's uh, one one woman from I think she's in Georgia. She's awesome. She's always tweeting us and talking about the cat. And every now and then we'll get comments like, well, "Your cat didn't show up on the episode. Is where is he?" I'm like, "Oh my god, <laughs> he's fine. He's he fine. He's sleeping. Yeah. Just, he's good." <laughs> he was just tired of being on the podcast. He just needed a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's busy producing. It's fine. <laughs> oh, you should get my wee set of headphones. That would be so cute. <laughs> I don't think he would like that so much. That's no, it's, it's bad enough. We have a plaid shirt for him. What I call him is I, was, I said for Halloween he's going as an East Van lesbian. <laughs> I took the sleeves off it, so it's this little muscle shirt. <laughs> That's awesome. So one thing you've you've talked about, you know, using your pronouns. Um, why is it? like super important to you that people you know get or at least try to get pronouns right because I mean everybody wants to be respectful but there's still the people who are like I, you know you're a woman so I'm gonna call you she or her and you know there's the people who are just not open to it yet yeah. hopefully that changes <laughs> but like why is it super important to you Oh, my favorite thing too is, oh, that doesn't, it's not grammatically correct. You know what? I don't give a shit. Fucking use them. And actually it is. It is. So. Yeah. <laughs> the singular they is a thing. It has been a thing for a very long yeah. time. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's important in the way that it is. It's just like you said, it's respectful and you know, it is, it's affirming. Like it's, I'm not going to call you sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'm not going to call Chloe sir. Like it's just a thing. Like it's in, you know uh you just it's it's someone's identity and if you don't respect that then you're kind of a dick yeah <laughs> i'm not i'm not speaking for all trans people but i'm just saying <laughs> if you don't do this you're kind of an asshole and i'm not gonna like you sorry <laughs> that's fair that's fair um, are you finding like on things like you know surveys and stuff where you have to put like your title or your gender that more and more it's changing so that there is an option for you or do you think we're still like so far there's still so much work to be done I think in some stuff there is, um, I know with where I work now, we have some like volunteer sign up forms and they'll ask like your preferred pronouns and preferred name. And I think with Chloe's job, your intake forms say, what is your uh, preferred gender identity or yeah. what are your preferred pronouns? Um, I don't like this phrase preferred pronouns. Cause like, I don't prefer this. Like, this is how I identify. So like, <laughs> yeah. um, I do, I do like the option, but I think it's actually a lot of the youth <laughs> are coming up now and, and they're realizing that like it's it's beneficial to be open and accepting so um like newer organizations i think um organizations where there are younger people kind of at the helm and at the intake part of it they're saying like okay well, let's let's make sure we're encompassing everybody so rather than having like a drop down of male female it's just like what is your identity what are yeah. your pronouns what is your preferred name yeah and people can type it in so that you know they don't have to pick an option and it doesn't actually fit um why do you think there is still such a stigma associated with gender identity like i feel like we should be past this but no you know still yeah. a stigma. where has that stemmed from what's your thoughts and feelings Oh, man. Well, I think a lot of it stems from, you know, the society where we live in, like, it's a patriarchal society, everything is, you know, male dominated and um, all that kind of crap. But a lot of it, too, is misogyny. I know trans women are one of the most at risk groups, especially trans women of color. Um, and it's just a lot of that st violence stems from, oh, you're becoming a woman. Why would you do that? Why would you become something so insignificant and something? So it's it's just a lot of that kind of stuff. Um and again, I'm not speaking for the entire community. <laughs> this is just my thought. It's yeah, it's just anything that's not a straight white dude is other and therefore threatening, wrong, bad, whatever. So it's like the more other you get, yeah. the <laughs> more maligned you are. Yeah, the further you are away from like straight white dude, it's just like, oh, you're like five degrees of bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or it's no. like you're, oh, you're a straight white dude who's super religious. Oh, you're good in these guys' eyes. <laughs> Are they, yeah, then there's the whole religion factor, which oh, oh god, yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a shirt made that says "Recovering Catholic." It's just oh my god. Yeah, I like. Do you do you still have any family or friends who are still quite heavily religious that just don't quite get it yet, or have you got to the point where you're like, you know, I don't need to be friends or associate with those people anymore if they're not going to accept me for who I am. Uh, yeah, 
yeah, I kind of cut ties with my mom's shitty brother and his equally shitty wife and their their kids because I'm just like, no, no. They were homophobic as hell to begin with. And then I was just like, yeah, I don't need this in my life. And yeah, that was well before you realized you were yeah. non-binary, though. That, that was, was way more, before the gender stuff. That was just about the queer stuff. So. That was just yeah. like, yeah. Wow. My yeah, my uh, my mom, is a, she's adopted, and her adopted brother, uh, he was military. And, you know, he told me all the time, go to the military, it'll straighten you out. And I was like, you can go fuck yourself, dude. <laughs> God. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was just like, okay, no, 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 no. And then my, his wife, I, I don't like to say my aunt and my uncle, cause like I haven't talked to them in 12 years, more than that, I think. So I'm just like, no, you're dead to me. Um, they would, you know, she would say like, oh, you know, you know, God loves the sin, sinner, but hates the sin, but you know, you're fine. Just, if you just repent. And I was like, what the fuck? No. It's like, yeah, we're going to go back to confession, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go tell some creepy old dude in a dress that, uh, I'm sorry for being gay. No, no. Also, that dress is really ugly, and you should not wear those shoes with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to know, and this wasn't a question I had prepared, but um, I'd love to know if there's anything that people, any questions that people ask you that are like completely inappropriate, even if they're not like meaning to be inappropriate, or things that they say to you that you're just like, ugh. You know, like, is, is there still people oh, who ask stupid questions or say stupid things and you're like, you kind of have to re-educate? Oh, I'm trying to think. Have, have we heard anything recently? I don't think so. Actually, people are generally pretty good. Yeah, I mean, but this could this could be because, like I said, you know, penguins huddling together for warmth, yeah. like all the gays just kind of stay together. <laughs> and, and our friend circle is pretty diverse in terms of identities and sexualities. Um yeah, I think that I had some really stupid questions from a bunch of straight dudes in Calgary when I lived there, but that should be not a surprise to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember what they were? Oh, God. Um, a, lot, a lot of stuff around penises for some reason. It's like, well, how do you know if you've ever, if you've ever looked at one? I'm like, I've, I've, I've taken biology classes and no. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I mean, I'm and I'm like, yeah, and it's like also just like, well, you know, you do know that some women have penises, right? And then that's sort of a whole fucking fireball of hate. And I was like, okay, time to leave this party. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think we've kind of evolved past the who's the man in the relationship questions. I think. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, like yeah, I think who's the pants, that kind of thing. Yeah. For years, for years in like the lesbian community, it was like, well, who's the man here? It's like, well, neither one of us, because that's the point. Of- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I think, would, would they be asking gay dudes this no they probably wouldn't yeah i heard a great quote years ago that um the reason straight men are um usually the the most homophobic towards gay dudes is because they're scared a gay dude is going to treat them the way cis white dudes or cis straight dudes treat women mm, so true yeah oh you're gonna get objectified by a big scary dude yeah have fun with that yeah. Do you like that? No, don't do it again. <laughs> don't do it to women. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, yeah, that's fair. I mean, yeah, it's, I can only imagine some of the questions that uh, you've got in the past and even gay men have got, you know, I've, I've heard people, well, who's the giver and who's the receiver? And it's like, you know, that's not yeah. your fucking business. <laughs> yeah, that's like, the thing. It's just like, that's too personal. No. Uh, <laughs> like, we no. can make jokes about, like, who's a top or a bottom, like, with cartoon characters, like, you know, on She-Ra, like, She-Ra just finished. So there's all this, you know, jokes going around Tumblr, like, oh, so-and-so is a top. And I'm like, A, the cartoon characters, and B, like, who cares? <laughs> Nobody cares. I know. It's I know. very fun and very gay. Nobody cares. Yeah. Do you know, actually, yeah. here's, here's another question for you, just because you're both like so into the pop culture world. I'm curious to know your views on like how non-binary and even queer people are represented in like the TV and movie industry these days, because you definitely see that it's starting to happen. Um, mm-hmm. Like it sounds like Xena kind of paved the way a little bit, <laughs> you know that, and I'm sure some other shows, but uh, like where do you think we're at now in that? Like, do you see enough representation or do you think more's got to happen? I think trans representation in general is still not great, not where it needs to be. It's definitely getting better. Um, And the whole 
non-binary thing. I mean, there's a non-binary character one in uh, One Day at a Time, which is great because people love that show. And that's yeah. and it's geared towards kids, so it's like giving kids this, you know, this option of of identity in a very like family friendly kind of way. Yeah, so it's definitely starting to get better. But I mean, people never talked about non-binary identities at all in general, and it, like amongst each other until fairly recently so yeah i'm gonna admit something highly embarrassing um part of the reason i figured out my identity was because of a dumb fucking web series called carmilla (laughs) (laughs) which was based on the lesbian vampire novella uh like it predated dracula by a bunch of years so i'm just like so this production company from toronto made it into a web series and one of the characters was non-binary and they use gender neutral pronouns and i was just like oh that's an option because I I went to grad school for gender studies and you know I would say like can we discuss like you know not just white feminist scholarly stuff can we discuss genders and transgender theory and they're like no we can't do that really? and I was like well it's not for me then goodbye mm. yeah I dropped out of grad school because it was that's a, that's a whole other podcast <laughs> yeah. yeah that's too long a story for here I think but... yeah that's a huge that's, yeah um but yeah so um I I was just like oh okay well if academia is not you know, having these conversations, then, okay, then it's not real, not valid. Okay, fine. But I was hearing other things from the community. So I think that either we need to get away from academia as like the be all end all of this is what's right and true. And here's all the research or just like actually start listening to the fucking community. Yeah, we're all here. Like, what's your, my, my biggest peeve is like, what's your source on that? Me, my life. That's my source. Yeah. Thank you. My experience. <laughs> sure. yeah. yeah. And I'm like we are getting better with stuff like like there's a character on one day at a time like chloe said um and it was a character on carmella which was just like oh, okay this is this is it makes sense now i hate that character by the way the character is awful <laughs> um <laughs> and i know there are a couple of others too but i'm blanking on what they oh, are d- right double now. trouble from shira oh that's okay. one yes and i i i i'm a huge fan of shira like i have a catra shirt like it's it's a big thing um but I, I have to take a little bit of issue with Noel Stevenson, the creator, um, because when the, the character was uh, introduced, very much a self-serving kind of villain character. And I'm like, cool, we're there, but also still a villain. Can yeah, not- so it's like you're representing that person as a bad person. Yeah, yeah which is... Yeah. It's not great. And like we have things like Pose, which is a show about the New York ball scene in the 80s. Like, you know, and that was mostly trans women who would, you know, walk and do the, you know, the category is whatever. Um, Trans women and um, gay men of color. Yeah, usually. Mostly, yeah. yeah. Um, So that's, you know, that's shows like that now are are getting away from that terrible trope of the 80s, 90s of um, the trans character being like the villain or like the butt of a joke, like the crying game. And like yeah. Ace Ventura, like that kind of stuff. So we're getting away from that, but we still have a lot of places to go with it. And it seems like there's only queer people writing these stories. So I'm like, maybe give us a chance to actually get out there and do more. Because yeah. like Shira is hugely popular. Monday at a Time is hugely popular. Yeah. So like there, there is a demand for this. Like let us tell our stories. Mm-hmm. Hire me. Like, yeah, I sure. was going to say like hire. Like you could even consult. You know what I mean? Yeah. To, to people who want to write shows just to kind of share your experience so they can base characters on you and stuff so i don't i don't have any connections but get out there <laughs> I, do, I do talk to supergirl and batman when said a lot so i'm just like i'll walk by like i'll style my hair it's like you know look i have the gay hair come come hire me i know what i'm doing uh, yeah i'm gonna get blocked from the supergirl twitter though I'm, i've been kind of kind of snarky about some of the stuff on supergirl batwoman though they can hire me i'll, I'll work for batwoman Awesome. Okay. Anyone who's listening who has connections, hire Sarah. <laughs> Sarah is very funny and smart. You should hire them. <laughs> and I have great hair. Yeah, you do. Yeah, Chloe actually cut my hair a couple weeks ago. I know. I love the color in both of like your hair. I love the Instagram photos of like the different hairstyles and the different hair colors. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so envious because I'm one of these lame asses who's just too scared to die her hair mostly because my mom told me never to do it because then you have to keep it up and blah 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 but um, it's true true. i know but i should just do it anyway i should stop just being fucking you know scared ass and just go do it (laughs) that's that's what chloe did yeah (laughs) though that being said after many years of bleaching my hair i have to give it a little bit of a break because my hair has thinned out a bit so (laughs) okay yeah 
<laughs> I know. Yeah, I should do it. And so my next question would be, what advice would you give to someone who feels like, you know, the gender that they were assigned to at birth isn't doesn't align with who they are and they just you know need some resources someone to talk to I love that your cat's chiming in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. he just no, woke up totally fine totally fine um yeah like is there any kind of support groups or like where should they reach out kind of for support and for information um I think the biggest advice I can give to anybody kind of questioning things is just try it out like try new pronouns try a new name try to see how it feels like you're not going to know if anything is going to work or it's going to stick until you kind of get in it and live it um and yeah and if people are giving you shit for it then maybe consider them not friends anymore like if if someone's going to belittle you for your identity and for trying to like come to terms not even come to terms with like you know figure out who you are as a complete person and they're not supportive and they're not giving you the the support you need like you don't need that negativity <laughs> Um, and there are support resources out there. I um, I would say start with Transcare BC. They have a list of uh, support groups, therapists, um, that kind of stuff. I don't know. I haven't been in university for years. I'm not really sure what UBC and Simon Fraser have. Um, there, you went to UBC. There's a gay club on campus. Yeah, I don't. I, I it wasn't super involved though. <laughs> I used it to pick up girls a couple of times. That's about it. <laughs> That was Chloe's personal dating site for a while. Okay. <laughs> this is a good place to look. Like, you know? I mean, you're guaranteed to find some queer ladies at the gay club on campus. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like this, this, you know, it's, it's difficult, especially now during like COVID stuff. Cause it's, you know, kids who may not be in the, in a safe home environment may not be able to, you know, access stuff as easily. And like GSAs are kind of all online, but if your parents aren't supportive and they're kind of hovering around you, it's like, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, there's, there's resources out there. You just kind of have to look for them, but I'd say start with trans care because they'll have a lot of resources for um, youth and, and for parents actually too. Cool. And cool. partners. I think there's a partner support group there sweet i'll definitely post the link to that in the show notes uh my last question would be well, i'm going to say this is my last question but half the time i end up asking another one or two <laughs> we have no plans today to decide to pack up some books <laughs> <We're all good. laughs> uh, so what ways can cisgender people be better allies to like the lgbtqia2 plus community hmm i mean like let us have our our time to you know have our voices be heard but also if you can use your platforms to elevate our voices please help us out i think that's I, that was what i would mostly really um stress um people are their own are experts on their own identities and their own lives and I mean, people who are cisgender, for example, cannot possibly understand what it's like to be trans. Like, I live with a non-binary person. I'm married to one, but I certainly, and I can be sympathetic or whatever. But I, I, I don't, I don't walk in their shoes, so I don't, you know, understand yeah. everything. And yeah. as that, you can, you need to just really look at yourself and realize that, and not try to be the expert, and not try to dictate how someone should live their lives or who they should be. Yeah. And that's, and that's, I think a huge important point to make is like you, as someone who's not living this experience, like you don't have any authority over how this experience should be going. Well said. And I mean, yeah, and I, I appreciate that the government is, you know, is taking strides for people to have like an X gender marker on, on ID, which is fabulous, but that does pose a whole other list of problems as we go traveling. Like I will never have that on a passport until everywhere I want to go in the world will recognize that mm. as valid because I don't want to get to an airport and then be like, LOL, no, you're not allowed because <laughs> this isn't, this isn't a real thing. Yeah. Also call people in your lives out when they're shitty. Oh yeah, definitely. If you hear someone being a piece of shit, tell them they're being a piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Call it. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. Well, this has been awesome. Is there anything else you want to share or tell the listeners? Um, I don't know. Be nice to trans people. <laughs> uh, yeah, be nice to trans people. Support small businesses in Vancouver. Uh, we want we want some stuff to be open when we're all allowed to leave our houses again. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much for listening. I really hope that you enjoyed our episode. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I highly recommend that you listen and subscribe to both of Sarah and Chloe's podcasts, Warriors, Bards and Brews, and Feminist Killjoys. And you'll find both of them on your favourite podcast player. I'll obviously link to them in the show notes too, so you can find them a little bit easier. And do follow them over on Instagram at WBB underscore podcast and FKJ pod. I'll make sure to post all of those links in the show notes. If you enjoyed our conversation or you have any comments that you'd like to share, then you can head over to the episode page on our website, uncomfortable.blog, and you can post them in the comments box. You can also follow us over on social media. We are at uncomfortable.blog on Facebook and Instagram and uncomfy underscore podcast on Twitter. If you like what you heard, then please do head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a lovely little review and make sure to hit all five of those stars. You can also support us on a monthly basis because we are an independent podcast and you can do that by becoming a patron and pledging as little as two to five dollars a month. Your monthly pledges will help this little podcast continue its journey by covering costs such as website and podcast hosting, editing software and equipment upgrades. I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Now go out there and get uncomfortable.